All right. Um, okay. Um, welcome everyone to the uh, fourth uh, now in our series, uh, in our lecture series. Um, and uh, we have with us today, uh, Professor Eric Winsberg from the University of South Florida. Um, he is uh, a philosopher of science, like virtually everyone else who has been part of the series. And uh, also like many other people in this series, uh, he's notable for highlighting uh, areas of philosophy of science that have been traditionally neglected or underappreciated, uh, but are still of vital importance, especially the way science is done today. Uh, in particular, he's uh, written quite a bit uh, uh, on the philosophy of climate science, as well as the philosophy of computer simulation. And um, what we're gonna hear from him today is related to the first of those two topics. Uh, it's gonna talk about uh, geoengineering in the context of the idea of a cost of learning. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll let uh, Eric take over. So uh, we'll go for about 45 minutes to an hour for the talk, depending on how long it takes, eh? and then we'll uh, open the floor to questions. All right, go ahead, Eric. Hey, well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, the world is changing in, uh, very quickly these days. Uh, suddenly we're, I'm giving talks in India from my, from my own uh, apartment, which is kind of cool. Um, so, so yeah, so this is the kind of uh, new sort of work for me. Um, most of my, uh, work in my career has been pretty straightforwardly sort of standard epistemology of science. So, so Turin is right that, uh, I, I've always looked at areas of science that I thought were under, understudied by philosophy of science, but, but most of my work has been sort of ordinary. Uh, in the sense of just being epistemological, uh, and this is sort of new work for me, and that it's a kind of crossover between uh, epistemology and ethics of science. So, um, good. So the question is um, whether uh, what what one, what one's attitude ought to be towards engaging in research um, into geoengineering, but also just sort of thinking about overall what a, what what the right framework is for thinking about whether there are areas of scientific research that we ought to discourage. Um, and here I don't really know exactly what one might mean by discourage uh, anything from, you know, social shunning of people who engage in it to pushing for it being maybe illegal or whatever. So people obviously uh, occasionally think there are areas of scientific research which we shouldn't pursue. So Philip Kitcher uh, as a, from philosophy of science, I think has a kind of, uh, canonical paper on this that I'll talk a little bit about. But okay, so, um, but certainly there has been uh, vocal opposition to research into geoengineering. So, for example, in 2011, uh, there was an experiment called uh, SPICE that was being carried out uh, at the University of Bristol. Uh, they were hoping to figure out um, what some of the properties of certain kinds of aerosols that you might spray into the uh, stratosphere might be. Um, and uh, there was quite a bit of opposition to, the, to this experiment being carried out. So uh, a letter was sent to Britain's climate minister, it was signed by many environmental groups. They claimed that the experiment uh, violated uh, a convention on biological diversity, which was kind of a strange, um, since this was, this, I take it the Convention on Biological Diversity was, was meant to be uh, about um, genetic engineering and that kind of stuff. Uh, but, um, uh, but in 2010, uh, uh, the CD, CBD did seem to place a taboo on geoengineering implementations um, and seemed to maybe put some uh, restrictions on even research into that kind of activity. Um, more recently, uh, so for example, Cambridge University this year announced the opening uh, of something they call the Center for Climate Repair as part of the university's Carbon Neutral Futures Initiative. Um, and the center does research into a variety of so-called engineering technologies, including uh, the, the somewhat considerably less controversial carbon capture, uh, which I'll talk about in a sec, but also um, uh, uh, solar uh, solar radiation management, uh, which is quite a bit more pop controversial. So the response to that has not been uh, particularly positive. Um, the Patrick Daly, I noticed, just happened to notice this, the Global Science Environment Correspondence for Agence France Press, tweeted that the center is, quote, a tremendous waste of time and money, 
that uh, chose the fossil fuel lobby's line. Um, he described solar radiation, man man solar radiation management as a, a, a batshit crazy idea. It's a bit like setting fire to your house and then trying to put it out by turning on the air conditioning. Um, this is, I don't think these are terribly uh, unusual sorts of remarks about solar radiation management. Um, uh, some environmental groups think that this kind of research is being advanced on behalf of the fossil fuel companies and an attempt to, uh, quote, shift policy norms so that previously unthinkable notions and activities like solar radiation management might some become more extreme, mainstream and acceptable. Uh, and so there's a group called the Geoengineering Monitor that is sort of um, has this as their main agenda to, 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 to raise awareness about, the, uh, about this kind of research and oppose it. So they say, right, this much we know, geoengineering techniques do nothing to address the root causes of climate change, and evidence points to a high likelihood that rather than improving the climate, they will make things worse. Okay, so, so, um, so there were lots of people out there, uh, the point is, who think it's a bad idea Solar research, solar radiation management is a bad idea. It's like, you know, it's, it's batshit crazy. It's like turning on the air conditioning to put out the fire in your house. Um, and, uh, but more importantly, they seem to think that even investigating the possibility of this um, is intrinsically bad. It's, a, uh, it, it's, it's either going to, um, it's either going to just, I'll, I'll, I'll say a little more about, about this as we go. But the, the sort of two main concerns seem to be um, one that doing the research will kind of um, normalize people's attitudes towards this, so that when it comes time to deciding whether to do it or not, they'll be inured to how crazy it is. Um, and the second being that uh, it will encourage us to continue to uh, to continue your business as usual. Um, as far as uh, emissions and all that, and will discourage us from 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 seeking um, you know more sensible mitigation policies. Okay, so so I said I would say a little bit about um, I'd say a little bit about uh, this paper by Kircher, I think goes back to the early two thousands, um, and Kircher's uh, test case was uh, a paper about um, opposition. Uh, to uh, the sociobiology study group for, uh, uh, at Harvard. So um, this was a, a thing that happened, I think, in the early 80s. Um, uh, Stephen Gould and Richard Lewington, who were, were colleagues of E.O. Wilson, who had just written a book on sociobiology. Um, and Gould and Lewington, uh, you know, wrote this letter that was open letter. Um, they were all colleagues at Harvard. And Gould and Lewton said that, uh, you know, um, Wilson's study group was um, uh, doing things that were not, uh, not, good, for, um, not good for society, uh, that they were, that Wilson was in fact, was in, you know, in essence, an enemy of the people. Um, and it's not hard, I think, to see commonalities between the kind of letter that Gould and Lewton wrote um, and the kinds of things that you see people uh, like the, uh, like the, um, geoengineering, the geoengineering monitor saying about the SPICE project or people, what people say about Cambridge's new climate repair center. Um, so what was, uh, so what was, what was Kitcher's argument? Um, just in a nutshell, um, I'll get back to it in a sec, but, but Kitcher's argument in a nutshell was that there are certain kinds of scientific research which, if you do them, um, are overwhelmingly likely to lead to harm regardless of what evidence you collect. Um, uh, okay, but, but um, it, let's step back a sec, right? So um, how, how could it be, how could it be that um, conducting research, just gathering new information uh, could be bad? Um, and to sharpen the question, I think it's worth reminding ourselves of a theorem uh, of the famous uh, statistician and decision theorist I.G. Good. And what, what Good's theorem tells us is that under certain ordinary conditions, um, free information is always good, right? 
So in other words, uh, of course, it might not be good to spend money to get information or to spend your time or your effort to get information, but setting aside uh, those costs, um, uh, free information uh, uh, can never reduce your expected utility. Good. So, okay. So, there, so we have this theorem, but of course, the fact, I don't take that theorem to be, uh, I don't take that theorem to be decisive because like all theorems, it has certain presuppositions. So, so but, but thinking about what those presuppositions are, I think helps us to get clear on what the various um, costs beyond, of course, like the, just the money that you would spend on collecting the evidence, what the other costs of research are. Because I take it most of the, um, most of the opposition to geoengineering research uh, is not, you know, some of that is privately funded anyway. Uh, so the opposition is not just that oh, this is a waste of money. Uh, the opposition seems to be quite a bit stronger than that. So, so I just kind of want to bracket what might be the cost of doing the, the, the literal financial cost of doing this research and, and think more about what, what the other sorts of costs are that people have in mind. Okay, so, so Grid's theorem tells us, wait, if you're getting free information, um, that's always good. Of course, there are, uh, there, are, there are sort of two caveats we have to be quite serious about here. One is that in addition to the straightforward uh, financial costs of gathering, of gathering evidence, um, there could be negative externalities associated uh, with gathering information that, that aren't associated with their direct financial costs, right? For example, and I take this as the, this is the most obvious and glaring one in the case of certain kinds of scientific research, um, you might, uh, in, in, in reviewing to other people that you're willing to collect the evidence, um, you might cause some unwanted actions by other people, right? So um, uh, obviously, right, if you, um, you know, if you, if you have somebody that you've, uh, if you have somebody that you've imprisoned for some crime or something like that, right? If you then start to gather new evidence about the crime, you've now signaled maybe that your judicial procedure that put them in, in jail in the first place was not as reliable as you thought it would be. So, so there are various ways in which by, by, by allowing other people to see that you're collecting evidence, you could be signaling things to them about yourself that you might not want to signal and they could have negative effects. Uh, so that's one, that's one way in which uh, Good's theorem might not apply, right? Because the costs of research aren't limited merely to their financial costs, there could also be signaling costs. Um, and the second is that there might be a condition of Good's theorem that does not apply. Um, and so, 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 uh, so, what is, so what's, to my mind, the most important condition for Good's theorem to apply is what uh, he called, and is sometimes called in the, in the literature, reflection. Okay, so this is a kind of a decision theory condition. Um, and it says something like the following. Uh, in order for Good's theorem to apply, it must be that the person evaluating the expected utility of conducting research is the one whose credences uh, will be used when conditionalizing on the new information. Um, uh, and, and the one whose uh, utilities will be in play when, when the it's decided what to do with the information. So, right, more crudely, right, if present me thinks that future me might misinterpret the evidence, uh, then present me might judge the belief revision that will occur in the light of the misinterpretation of the evidence to have negative expected utility, right? So in other words, right, um, uh, if you think that tomorrow you're going to be really, really dumb and bad about interpreting the evidence that you collect tonight, then it might not be good for you to collect that evidence. Right? It's, only if you, it's only if you assume that you're going to uh, have the same credences and, and, and likelihoods tomorrow that you do today that Good's theorem says that you can't, it can't ever be bad for you to get new information. Um, but of course, uh, that's all just in an individual context. Um, in a group context, it also means that uh, if I'm worried that the people with whom I need to coordinate my future decisions won't interpret my new information in a manner which I agree, then getting new information might reduce my expected utility uh, more severely than its pre facial cost would suggest. 
And I take it this is, um, though Kitcher doesn't mention Good's theorem or talk about it exactly this way, I take it his argument uh, is basically uh, that there is a failure of reflection um, in the case of research into um, the biological uh, origins of inequality. Okay, so Kitcher is interested in the question of, well, should we be allowed to conduct research? Um, because in fact, this is what Lewitton and uh, this is what Lewitton and Gould were accusing Wilson of engaging in, although I'm not sure if that was entirely a fair accusation, but set that aside. Uh, what Kitcher is here concerned about is research into the biological origins of various kinds of ec uh, economic inequality. Um, so in other words, right, um, looking into the question of whether um, members of certain underrepresented groups, whether, whether, they be, uh, whether they be genders or racial groups, whether there are biological origins of their underrepresentation in various economic activities or uh, activities of, of social prestige of whatever kind, right? Um, and and Kitcher's argument went something like this, right? He said, um, look, we're, we're, we're a fundamentally racist and sexist society. And so um, if we gather evidence, uh, if we gather evidence that, for example, you know, um, women are less good at leadership or African Americans are less good at math or whatever, um, whatever sort of uh, silly hypothesis like that you might entertain. Kitcher says, if we, if we were to gather evidence for that, um, we're such a fundamentally sexist and racist society that the evidence in favor of uh, a hypothesis like that will be overestimated regardless of what the strength of it is. So, if the, if the evidence comes in uh, showing, you know, if the evidence comes in sort of very strongly showing that there isn't such biological origin, we'll just ignore it. And if weak evidence comes in showing that there is such a biological origin of inequality, everyone will be like, oh, yes, you see, we knew it all along. Um, all this economic inequality is grounded in biology. Uh, um, and then, and, and then Kitcher also says, right, uh, um, most people, right, most people already uh, sort of pretend that they don't believe that these hypotheses are true, uh, but act in sexist and, and racist ways anyway. So convincing them that there is no such biological or isn't, isn't likely to help people. But if you, if, you, if you somehow raise evidence that makes, that convinces people that there is the biological origin, then they're likely to behave, to behave worse, to behave in, in ways that, that harm uh, underrepresented groups more. Um, so in other words, right, Kitcher's saying, look, um, no, matter, you know, no, matter how the, no matter how the chips fall, uh, research into biological origins of inequality is just overwhelmingly likely to hurt people and has a very low probability of helping people. Um, and I think he thinks in part, right, this is because um, we should think this because we should understand that, you know, we, we sophisticated uh, discussers of this question, we should understand that the unsophisticated masses out there um, don't share our, don't share, don't share our um, predispositions to evaluate evidence. And so, and so Good's theorem fails, right? Reflection fails. Um, uh, we think that the new evidence is likely to persuade other people in a way that it wouldn't persuade us and that there's a tremendous bias there towards convincing them that, that, that there will be, that there will be harm. Uh, so, so convincing them that, um, that there is uh, a biological origin of inequality, which, would, which, which, which obviously causes harm if people falsely believe it. Okay, um, so, so I think we, we can sort of think similarly about um, the expected utility of research and, and geoengineering and ask whether it's negative. So I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of mostly persuaded by Kitcher's argument about, uh, about um, research into biological origins of inequality. I'm not sure, I don't think Kitcher ever exactly says how, you know, what it means to say that we should oppose that kind of research. He doesn't say we should ban it. He doesn't, he doesn't really spell out what it is. I'm not sure what my views on that are. Um, but I think his argument, his argument is, is more or less persuasive that the expected utility of that research is poor. Um, what, what, you, what you ought to conclude from that, uh, I, I don't, I'm not going to kind of um, say too much about. 
Okay, so so uh, so is the research into geoengineering negative? I don't think there's probably a general answer to that question. Uh, there are too many different kinds of uh, too many kinds of geoengineering. Uh, there are too many strategies. Uh, considerations for each of them are going to be different. Um, so okay, so what are some geoengineering strategies? Uh, so the IPCC sort of defines strat geoengineering as technical efforts to stabilize the climate system by direct intervention in the energy balance of the Earth for reducing global warming. Royal Society defines it as deliberate large-scale mani manipulation of the planetary environment to counteract anthropogenic climate change. Um, a lot of people sort of view it as a middle road between mitigation, right, which is usually defined as attempts to reduce emissions in the first place and adaptation, which is, you know, building, building sea walls or doing whatever you need to do to, to adapt to a changing climate. So it's somewhere in between because it's not really, it's not really adaptation. Uh, you're not, you're not, you're not, you know, you're not adapting to say, let's say raising, rising sea levels. You're trying to prevent the rising sea levels, but you're not doing it by mitigation. You're not doing it by, um, by reducing emissions, you're doing it by somehow allowing the emissions to increase and then doing something to the planet to counteract that. Okay, so, so one, one, one method of doing this, which is I think probably not terribly controversial, that's a little bit controversial when it counts as, uh, as geoengineering, and that's carbon dioxide removal, right? So the, the idea is burn all the fossil fuels or burn, you know, burn more fossil fuels than would otherwise be acceptable, um, and then somehow figure out a way of pulling that carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere and sequestering it somewhere. Um, so, I, that, you know, that, there's a sense in which that's geoengineering, but it's complicated because it's a little bit closer to mitigation than maybe other kinds of geoengineering. So I'm really not going to talk about carbon dioxide removal here. I don't think there are too many people uh, who are opposed to research into carbon dioxide removal. Um, it's, it's substantially less controversial. Um, another kind of strategy is what's known as earth radiation management, right? So we all know the central problem of climate change is that um, we have certain amount of uh, solar radiation coming in and uh, having there be too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, reduces the amount of uh, radiation that escapes the planet, right? Because carbon dioxide is kind of like a blanket that we're putting around the planet. Um, and so, right, the sort of more obvious thing to do would be to figure out a way of counterbalancing the, uh, the sort of blanket that we're putting around the planet with carbon dioxide by, by removing other existing blankets that are on the planet. Um, and so there are various ideas of this. Maybe you could disperse cirrus clouds over the polar regions by seeding them with ice crystals. Um, uh, and I'm also not really going to talk about um, earth radiation management in part because it's, I think, quite a bit more, um, quite a bit more speculative at this point, uh, although it, it is more directly, obviously, addressed at dealing with uh, the kind of climate change we're causing because we're causing the climate change by, um, by putting the blanket, so maybe you remove a little bit of the blanket elsewhere. Okay, but, but, but what, I'm, what I'm sort of more interested in here is, is uh, the most controversial kind of geoengineering strategy, which is solar radiation management. And the idea there is that since, since we've, you know, since carbon dioxide is uh, reducing the amount of outgoing radiation, maybe we could counterbalance that by in some way uh, uh, blocking some of the incoming radiation that comes from the sun. Uh, and there are a variety of methods people have talked about for doing this. You could plant uh, very reflective, so-called high albedo crops. Um, you could uh, clear forests that are blocking the albedo of fields of snow. Uh, there's something called marine cloud brightening, where you somehow make the, the marine clouds uh, more reflective by spraying them with a mist of seawater. You can paint roads and roofs white. Uh, I mean, there are crazy kind of science fiction stories about putting giant mirrors and orbit around the Earth. Um, but I think the, 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 the solar radiation management strategy that sort of people think is both uh, not too far science fiction-y al and also likely to have uh, a substantial impact, right? So, you know, the high albedo crops, uh, painting roads uh, white, 
not so science fiction-y, but probably not so effective. Giant mirrors in space, probably effective, but a little bit too science fiction-y. Uh, stratosphere aerosol injection, uh, the idea there is we know, for example, that in 1991, when um, Mount Pinatuba erupted, and, and sent quite a bit of ash into the stratosphere, uh, that it cooled the climate substantially over the next 12 months. And so the idea of stratos stratospheric aerosol injection is to do something like that deliberately, to like on a systematic, you know, uh, ongoing basis, figure out a way of injecting aerosols into the stratosphere, uh, usually uh, the idea is sulfates, um, that would just reflect back more of the sun's radiation back into space. Uh, and, and the hope then would be that that would partially or entirely cancel out uh, the warming effect of, of having too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, so, so why do I think this is the best test case for thinking about, uh, for thinking about this? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's generally regarded to have the, the, the highest cooling capacity of any of the strategies I've talked about. It's generally considered to be likely to be cheap to implement. I've seen estimates that like we could probably do this for $10 billion a year. Uh, it's not too science fiction-y, but it's something we can do with existing technologies. Um, so those are sort of its like positives. And then its negatives, which I think make it a, a good case study for, for, um, for thinking about uh, restricting research. Uh, there's an enormous amount, I think, of uncertainty about what its total effect will be. Right. Um, and here, the, the, the obvious problem here, of course, is that um, because you are rather than, you know, getting rid of the getting rid of the uh, of the warming of, uh, you know, the blocking of outgoing radiation, you're balancing that out by blocking off the incoming radiation. Um, it's extremely unlikely that you're going to be able to exactly cancel out all the effects of uh, of global warming, right? So um, when we think about when we think about global, so you know, right? When we think about global warming, we don't usually even use that phrase anymore, right? We now usually use the phrase climate change in part to emphasize the fact that it's not just the warming that we're worried. It's not just the average warming of the planet we're worried about. Uh, we're worried about all the all the detailed regional effects that global climate change might have, shifting precipitation patterns, etc. Um, and it's a really open and complicated question to what extent we could come up with a, a, a sophisticated enough cocktail of solar, radi solar radiation management to not only prevent uh, the planet from warming, but to prevent uh, climate change at the regional level in all kinds of ways, right? So it's perfectly possible that you could create a, uh, you know, uh, create a solar radiation management scheme that would bring the average surface temperature of the globe right exactly back to pre-industrial levels, but uh, at the same time um, wreak havoc on all kinds of regional uh, climate patterns, right? Still be uh, you know, causing drought in various places, still be shutting down the thermal haline, still having ice shelves collapsing because you know, polar regions. So you know, it, it's not obvious, right, that just because you could balance out uh, the average temperature of the earth uh, that you would that you'd be fixing things overall okay so 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 uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about it uh, it also has some some obvious foreseeable bad consequences um, and and uh, just some repeating myself a little bit here but right it, it's going to have varied impact on the planet so people when people talk about solar radiation radiation management they very often will discuss the idea that they're going to be winners and losers uh, in a solar radiation management scheme, right? Um, the obvious winners are going to be people who are worried about um, uh, sea level rise. You probably almost, you probably almost certainly uh, prevent sea level rise with solar radiation management. But people who are worried about, um, you know, incurring drought or uh, et cetera might be more worried about being losers in an SRM scheme. Okay. So, so opposition, right? Um, I'm going to talk about sort of three fundamental uh, uh, sources of uh, opposition. One is what you might think of as the moral hazard argument about investigating uh, SAI. Uh, second, having you harmful foreseeable consequences um, and then unforeseeable consequences of employing um, stress. So SAI here, stratospheric aerosol injection, which is the particular kind of solar radiation management.
scheme I'm talking about. Uh, okay, so harmful foreseeable consequence. Um, uh, uh, one, right, people mention this a lot. Uh, CO2, of course, also causes ocean acidification. If you decide that you're going to just kind of continue to produce uh, carbon dioxide emissions and hope to counterbalance that with some kind of SAI scheme uh, or SRM scheme generally, you're going to be doing nothing to offset ocean acidification. Um, uh, and right, this is not maybe a third time I'm making this point, right? They're going to be, they're going to, you know, they're going to be, to at least to some extent, um, both, both, but losers alongside winners of any of any kind of uh, SAI scheme. Okay, um, so uh, um, so there are some pretty obvious foreseeable consequences. Uh, you know, you're going to make um, you're going to make uh, the you're going to make the, the world just fundamentally look different. Um, you're gonna, you know, uh, you're gonna uh, make a whiter, the sky will be less blue than it is now, it'll sort of touch turn white, sunsets will be redder. What the effects of that on crop production uh, are unclear. Some people claim corn production would be hurt, but other crops might benefit. Uh, obviously, CO2 itself, just, you know, Keteris paribus, ignoring all its other effects, are generally uh, good for crops, but um, solar dimming, probably bad for crops. Um, SII could cause ozone depletion. Uh, so we know that sulfates, if sulfates mix with the chlorofluorocarbons that hurt the ozone, they kind of accelerate the rate at which CFCs hurt the ozone. Sort of unlikely that, if, if, in other words, if we solved the CFC, if we totally eliminated CFCs from the planet, then it's unlikely that SAI would cause ozone depletion, but the interaction between SAI and CFCs probably would accelerate the rate of ozone depletion, which is obviously uh, a bad thing. Um, a lot of people talk about the fact that SAI has a very short lifespan. So um, it's probably, got, you know, any, any, anything that anytime you're ejecting this stuff into the atmosphere, it's probably good for about three months. Uh, and then people talk about this being kind of sort of Damocles, right? Because if you, if you allow there to be emissions that would get us to, you know, two degrees warming, three degrees warming, four degrees warming, and you were canceling this out with an elaborate global SAI uh, scheme. Uh, anything that then disrupted that, whether it was you know war or um, you can imagine any 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 number of things disrupting this kind of um, global scale you know engineering project. Uh, anything that did that then would, over the course of just several months, cause a very rapid increase uh, in temperature of the planet, which would be probably pretty scary. So, so that's uh, what people think is one, maybe one harmful foreseeable consequence. Um, and then, of course, there, you know, uh, there are all kinds of, I start to list unforeseeable consequences, but, um, you know, you could get non-climactic consequences. Maybe this stuff in the atmosphere would harm human health or damage ecosystems, uh, just as any other particles in the atmosphere might do. Uh, there might be, you know, uh, um, unforeseen climactic effects that it might even be hard to tell. Uh, some people claim, you know, that um, I've heard this claim made about it, that it could, in principle, uh, affect the monsoon season in India. Um, but sort of also alarming is that um, you might have a disrupted monsoon season in India and then not know Right? Was this just normal climate variability that, you know, I guess happens every once in a while, or is this in fact the effect of some uh, of the scheme that you're implementing? And so the not only, not only are there, is there the possibility of actual effects, but there's a possibility of sort of just weird climate things happening at random and then not knowing whether it's the result of, of, your, of your geoengineering scheme or not. Um, and then people think there are all kinds of possible geopolitical consequences. Uh, so, you know, any, um, any state that then found itself to be uh, a net loser of a geoengineering strategy might go to war to stop it, right? So, you know, uh, if, if, if something like what I mentioned a while ago happened in India, uh, I don't know why India, get, India happens to get mentioned a lot in this context. Uh, it's one of the reasons I kind of wanted to give the, give the talk to you guys. Um, uh, so in other words, if one country like, like let's say India, was a, you know, 
felt itself to be a net loser from this, felt itself to have had its uh, precipitation patterns disrupted in a way that was causing famine, uh, might, might go to war um, and try to prevent this. Uh, um, uh, either because it actually is a net loser or just because it thinks it's a net loser. Um, and, uh, uh, and then some people claim that you could use a well-researched SAI strategy as a weapon. That seems to me sort of unlikely. Anybody who wanted to use this as a weapon right now could probably go right ahead and use it as a weapon without there being, you don't need a lot of research probably to use this as a weapon. So, okay. Good, okay, so, so cost of learning considerations then. Uh, argument one, um, you might think, look, um, my credence in the proposition that SA strategies could be beneficial is so low. You might think this is such a crazy idea uh, that, um, that, you know, there's no way that, there's no way that any research is ever gonna convince somebody who's, who shares my credences uh, to, to believe that this is gonna be effective. The only way, and this is a bit like Hitch's argument, right? Hitch was basically saying, Look, I just, I just think it's so unlikely that uh, African Americans uh, are economically disadvantaged in the United States because their genes are bad. Uh, I think that's so unlikely that I just think any research that showed that, that convinced other people of that would just have to be flawed because it's so unlikely to be true. So you might think that's the case about the suitability of SAI. Um, and so therefore, right, SAI just has uh, a non-trivial probability of, uh, of, of offering stronger support than it ought to, but zero probability of doing the opposite, right? So in other words, the, the, the likelihood of, of erring on the side of thinking that uh, this is effective when it isn't is high, and the likelihood of, of erring in the other direction is, is negligible. And you might think that's a good reason right there just for not doing the research. Um, uh, uh, a second, a second argument might be, look, the people who do this research or who are responsible for disseminating it uh, might not share my values, right? Um, so, they might, uh, so they might conduct the research or disseminate the research in a way that I would consider to be biased um, uh, in favor of uh, it being beneficial to implement this strategy. Uh, so that may be another reason. You might think, look, yeah, no, it's fine. You know, the, uh, I, don't, I don't really have... Um, I don't really have an exactly, you know, super low prior on this working, but, um, you know, I, my, my values are such that some of the things I think are foreseeable negative consequences are worse than what other people would be evaluating as evidence that it might be. Um, uh, okay, good. So, so let's talk about this biased reporting idea. And this is a pretty, pretty commonly uh, leveled accusation. Um, I'm, I'm told by various people that some of this is just wildly overstated. Um, but in any case, this is a view people have, uh, whether, it's, whether it's true or not, I don't have a, a firm opinion about. Um, but a lot of people seem to think that all of this must be funded by, um, this must be funded by the, uh, by the uh, uh, you know, petro energy uh, industry. Um, uh, and so um, these are people who are uh, bi strongly biased in favor of convincing people that geoengineering can work. They don't really care whether it gets implemented in the future or not. They just want people to think that it will work. And so then they'll be more happy to, uh, to, to continue to burn fossil fuels, which is, of course, since these are fossil fuel companies, um, they're, they're um, uh, right. So they say this is geoengineering, just quoting geoengineering monitor here. Uh, more than a limited science experiment, the geoengineers have here to have a different agenda to slowly build mainstream legitimacy for large scale experiments that ultimately lead to the deployment of solar geoengineering. Uh, they claim that some of the key players here are like Exxon, Mobil, and Shell. Okay, so in any case, right, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not claiming to adjudicate the question of whether this is true or not. Um, but, um, but, uh, but here's what, here's what does seem to uh, definitely be true. It's pretty well documented that when scientific research is sponsored or funded by industry players who have a financial interest in having the research come out in a particular way, then it tends to be more likely to come out in a way that favors industry players. This is a familiar result from toxicology. 
talk, studies concerning the toxic properties of low doses, for example, of bis bisphenol A, uh, seem to have been strongly affected by who was funding the research. Most of the research that was publicly funded found that bisphenol was, was a carcinogen, and most of it that was privately funded by uh, industries that used bisphenol found that it was non-toxic. So it's not, this is not super surprising at all. Um, people have interests, when they have interests, uh, it tends to affect uh, the outcome of their scientific research. Um, okay, but, but, but you might wonder then, um, but then you might wonder then what the best solution to that is. Um, and uh, if you kind of look at the philosophy of science literature on bias and research, I find rather persuasive uh, the argument that um, the best antidote to bias in scientific research is what Torsten Wilhelm calls conventional methodological standards. So for example, in the bisphenol case, what was going on if you went and looked at what enabled the industry-sponsored research to strongly favor the conclusion that bisphenol was not toxic, is that they were using estrogen in sensitive rats and bisphenol is toxic because it mimics estrogen. Um, and uh, there's nothing sort of, you know, there's not, there's not some, some obvious God-given scientific rule that says you shouldn't use uh, estrogen in sensitive rats if you're doing a toxicology study. But there is now a record, and as a result of this, there is now a recognized methodological um, convention, which is that if you're studying, uh, if you're studying um, uh, a, a potential toxic agent, that mimics um, uh, the hormonal system of an organism, you better not use a, an organism that's, that's resistant to that hormonal pathway. Uh, so, so Will Holt says, look, one of the things we learned from this episode is conventional methodological standards are really important um, and they're one of the best ways of mitigating bias in scientific research. Um, and, and you might think something like the following thing, and I, I, I'm inclined to, I, I am inclined to believe this, that um, public support for research into various topics will bring it out into the open um, and will allow for the creation of intercoordination projects, uh, things that we now um, know already exist, right? Um, and uh, intercoordination projects allow for the establishment of potential standards, uh, which can, in my opinion, I think, reduce the possibility of, of, of bias in scientific research. So um, it seems to me that uh, um, if, you're, if you're sitting in sort of the point of view that I sit um, and you're worried, about, uh, you're worried about industry funded research being um, substantially biased in one way or another, one of the best antidotes to that is uh, I think to, to actually encourage public research into coordination projects establishment of, uh, of methodological norms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, I think, is, is, is your best bet for mitigating um, this kind of scientific bias. Because I think if you push scientific research into uh, you know, privately, privately funded spheres, then you're more likely to get. You're more likely to get. Uh, OK, second, right? Um, should, we, should we assign an extremely low credence to the hypothesis that SEI could be beneficial? Um, uh, I guess I sort of think not so much, right? Um, there's sort of two reasons you could think this, right? You might think it's scientifically impossible or you might think it's politically ungovernable. Um, uh, with, with, regard to, um, uh, with regard to ungovernability, uh, you know, right? Some people say this, right? If someone uh, would become a net loser, um, uh, then uh, they wouldn't tolerate a system like that. Um, uh, <clears throat> but it seems to me, right, that this is not really a consequence of conducting the research. It's not, you're not going to get, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to, there's no pathway, it seems to me, from simply conducting into research to having an ungovernable situation, right? And it seems to me, um, you, if, you, if you conduct research, um, that's going to sort of facilitate governability uh, in a way that, that uh, eliminating research won't. Um, so uh, I'll just skip ahead here a tiny bit here. Um, okay, yeah, so um, 
here's another here's another reason that you might think that um, here's another reason you might think that uh, um, that, it, that the, the research is extremely unlikely to be uh, to have a positive utility, and that's you might think it's just um, it's just so uh, um, it's just so un unlikely to have beneficial consequences. And here, I think one one has to sort of um, in order, to, in order to think about whether you think that the strategy is likely to have to be usable or not, you have to have, I think, an attitude about um, what I would call climate pessimism or climate optimism, right? In other words, you might think, look, and I think this is probably right. I think this is probably right. Um, uh, solar radiation management is almost certainly going to have some substantial negative consequences, right? I think it's extremely unlikely that we're ever going to devise a solar radiation management scheme that has no negative consequences. But if you're thinking about, if you're sort of deciding what, you know, right now your prior on, on this ought to be vis-a-vis -vis whether it's ever going to be something we would want to do or not, you have to have, uh, you have to have a pretty clear attitude about how bad you think things are likely to get, um, even under the best mitigation scheme you think is going to happen. So I think if you're kind of, and I, 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 unfortunately, I think I tend to lean a little bit more towards the climate pessimism side. I think we're probably likely to end up with, we're probably going to end up with some negative, pretty negative consequences of climate change. And so it seems to me that it's not as crazily unlikely as maybe some other people think that this is going to at some point look like not such a bad balance, right? Yeah, it's going to have these negative consequences. But we're going to have so much harm on the other side too uh, that maybe it's not a terrible idea. Okay, so if you think there's some non-trivial probability of that it'll go for some benefit, you might think that in virtue of you know your of your your degree of climate pessimism. Um, okay, uh, what about some of the externalities of uh, what about some of the externalities of this stuff? Um, Good. So, so uh, I do think there's some good sociological historical evidence that um, uh, scientific research brings about possibilities for governance. So David Victor makes this argument in his book, Global Warming Good Gridlock, right? He points out that um, uh, coordinated research between uh, the Americans and the Soviets in the 70s and 80s about things like seismic research and weather modification, uh, it was coordinated scientific research that uh, enabled people to build treaties that, for example, uh, you know, the nuclear test ban treaty, things like that. So when people, the idea is that when states think that there are reliable bodies of experts, they're more likely to enter into um, uh, workable uh, international treaties. So if you're worried, in other words, this, the take home lesson here is, and I'm trying to wrap up quickly here, the take home lesson is if you are worried about governance, in other words, if you're worried about, wow, what will happen if we have the technology for doing this and then we can't, um, we can't, we can't somehow make a workable governance scheme out of this. Does that mean people will go to war over whether we use something like this? It seems to me that, um, uh, there's a good argument to be made here that, that actually engaging in uh, open, publicly funded, coordinated research uh, opens up rather than closes more doors towards future kind of international governance of this. Um, I'll skip this point and we come back to it in the Q&A. Okay, so last, so last, last point, right, um, is this point about, uh, about signaling, right? Is there moral hazard associated with uh, conducting research into solar radiation management? In other words, if you conduct research into solar radiation management, does this then signal to people, oh, everything's fine, we're gonna have a technology for dealing with climate change, keep driving your SUV, you know, keep, keep doing all these activities that add carbon dioxide to the planet uh, because we've got this silver bullet that's gonna do this. Um, this is, I think, a, a tricky empirical question, right? What, 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 in fact, what does it do to people uh, for their attitude toward mitigation if they find out that people are investigating, uh, are spending money investigating the, the, the potential usefulness of, um, of SAI, right? 
Uh, so here's one way, you know, so here's one, one statement of the problem. Geoengineering prints a strong economic, political, and psychological temptation to defer difficult and costly actions to future generation. This temptation, whether characterized as moral hazard, risk compensation, or political optimism, is a serious concern because geoengineering is widely acknowledged to be an inferior, problematic, and best temporary option, option for responding to climate risks. Um, right, uh, so, so, so this, I think, is an open question, right? How likely is it that the difficult and costly actions associated with mitigation uh, will be considered, um, uh, uh, you know, will make, will make geoengineering a luxury? Um, and, and, and what actually is the signaling value? Does it, as the moral, heart, moral hazard proponents argue, send a signal at all as well? Or right, does it send a signal that climate change isn't just a conspiracy promoted by lottates and haters of capitalism? Right, so there are lots of people who think this. Lots of people who think, oh, you know, you don't, you guys don't, you guys don't really believe that there's a climate catastrophe coming, because if you really believe there was a, I mean, I've heard this line a number of times, right, from from climate deniers. If you really believe there was a climate catastrophe coming, then you'd be taking this SRM stuff more seriously. The fact that you're not taking the SRM stuff seriously convinces me that the, that this is all just a bunch of hokey baloney. There's really no such thing as climate change. So, so it's not obvious which of these signals I think you're sending by, by, investigate, by inve investigating SRM. And there, there's been, there have been some, some survey studies on this. Um, uh, if you look at my paper, I cite a few of them at the end of the paper, uh, but I don't find them particularly decisive. And, and, and if anything, I think they, they probably lean a little bit more towards the, the second thing here that, that the, that people take the signaling value of, 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 of this kind of stuff to be, uh, to, to increase their sense of alarm in, the, in, in climate change. Uh, okay, I think I'll probably, I think I'll, I've probably gone on too long already, so I think I'll, I'll wrap it up there and, uh, and hand things back to uh, George. Uh, okay, uh, thanks a lot, Eric. Um, that was a uh, really useful talk. And, uh, um, and so I don't think I've mastered the Zoom talk yet. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a difficult adjustment, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think you did fine. Yeah, I don't think there was any major issue with the, with the talk. Yeah. Um, OK, uh, so now I'd, uh, I'll, I'll open the floor to questions. Um, just uh, like before, um, if you have a question, please use the raise hand function in the participants window of Zoom, and I'll come to you. Um, and please hold off on multiple questions. Um, just raise your hand multiple times if you have multiple questions rather than asking them all at once. Uh, are there any immediate questions? Okay, uh, maybe while people uh, contemplate the talk a little bit and think of questions, let me begin by asking uh, a question that I had. Um, and um, I'm a little unsure how to locate this within the kind of scheme you've given. Um, but um, one potential, I, I think it's a kind of signaling concern one might have about uh, certain forms of research is that um, the research is conducted in a kind of social or political environment where the fact that this is a, a topic being taken seriously sends the wrong kind of signal, right? So one might have that kind of concern about uh, research in, into racial or, sex, or gender differences, um, biological differences, that the issue, uh, the main issue with it is that there's something, there's some kind of commitment you make to your citizens in a democratic society, or your co-citizens in a democratic society, where even sort of thinking that anything can come off this idea of fundamental biological di differences itself a kind of abrogation of that agreement, whatever the likelihood may be of that actually being true, right? Um, that there's some kind of implicit agreement that you're not going to be uh, treating citizens as just their biology, biology or something like this. Um, and I mean, I think the, the, the force of that argument is, is less strong when it comes to, uh, uh, to SRM, but I think maybe one could still make this argument and, and perhaps it hinges on this question, to what extent would SRM in some sense change the nature, uh, or if SRM research was actually successful, and it turned out that it could actually be, it would actually change the nature of international climate discourse away from the even kind of mildly cooperative 
form of uh, uh, discourse we currently have towards a discourse where really powerful states could just take control of climate action without having to have any kind of uh, consensual um, uh, understanding with other uh, with other states and and so the very act of embarking on that kind of research at, at a large scale might be sending a kind of signal of disrespect for certain kind of international democratic conventions or something along those lines and that might be the signal one worries about right that's the good so 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 thank that that's a good question i, I think i talk about i, I think I, in the in the paper i do kind of touch on this issue um so look obviously there are two ways there are two ways srm could go right um one of them is the one that you the, the, the sort of the very negative version you're talking about so for example um a number of people have pointed out uh, that um, the United States and Saudi Arabia are um, probably overwhelmingly likely to be winners in an SRM scheme. Uh, we're both, uh, we're both um, petrochemical producers. We're both, we're both, you know, we're, we're both fossil fuel, net fossil fuel producers, Saudi Arabia, obviously in a massive way. Um, we're both primarily concerned about sea level rise as a consequence of climate change more than, uh, more than other things. I mean, right. So Saudi Arabia doesn't really produce any food. They buy all their food. Uh, we produce a lot of food, but we're probably pretty resilient to various kinds of precipitation changes. We're a large country. We have a very uh, efficient and mechanized food production system. So, so, so the U.S. and Saudi Arabia are probably net net winners, regardless of what we come to learn about SRM. Um, and so, you might think, like, one way this goes is, you know, we just we say, um, screw the rest of the world. Uh, this works for us. Uh, us, we have a pretty powerful, you know, uh, ability to protect something like this from from people who don't like it. Uh, and so, we're just going to do it. Now. Um, Sure, right. That's 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 not a that's not a that's not a world that I want to live in, right? Where that kind of. But I guess what one wants to ask then is, um, what are the ways in which what are the ways in which one uh, mitigates that outcome? Um, and that's a tricky social science question, I think. But I, I guess I'm mildly persuaded. Uh, so part of the problem with this paper is I'm only mildly persuaded of almost anything about it. It's a hard question. I don't really know what to think about it. But I'm mildly persuaded that um, well-funded, coordinated, internationally cooperative research um, promotes the likelihood of that outcome not happening. In other words, I think I'm mildly persuaded that that kind of research um, is more likely to bring us to a world where this gets decided in a cooperative international way. If, if you, I think if you oppose this research, you're not going to stop it. Um, you're going to, you know, you're not going to prevent. So, I mean, there was just, there was just a meeting in, in, in Switzerland, um, I think in, 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 in March or February of this year, where they tried to where they they tried they tried to set up an international ban of this kind of research, and and lo and behold, the United States and Saudi Arabia both blocked it. Uh, so so I think you're not you're not going to succeed at that. You're not going to succeed at uh, preventing countries like that from uh, from if if they if they really want to uh, do this just by blocking the research. But I, I do think there's maybe a small chance that by promoting the research, you set up a kind of, uh, you know, you, you grow a kind of international community around this that then facilitates better governance of it in the future, more cooperative international kind of governance in the future. That's the argument anyway. Um, I'm not sure what, how strongly I endorse that. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I'll come back to that uh, at the end of the questions, but uh, let me move on to the other questions that are currently being asked. Um, Mr. Prakash Thanabal has a question. Please go ahead. Uh, please unmute your mic. You're muted currently. Are you there? 
okay, maybe he's not there at the moment. Uh, Parjanya, uh, go ahead. Un okay, um, so I just read uh, an article a couple of days ago, I'm, I'm sure uh, more people in here have read it, about how um, the, uh, the 1.5 degrees Celsius gr uh, temperature growth target is supposed to be temporarily crossed by 2024 because of uh, a variability loop between the climate and um, El Nino, uh, the El Nino oscillation. Um, would it sort of be, uh, would this be a suitable avenue to sort of use this sort of a strategy for, a, as a, I use it as a testing ground for that sort of strategy? that, you know, we're not trying, you know, we're using it in a small scale um, issue. And it's, it, it, you said it might have um, sort of a foreseeable circumstance, foreseeable consequences, which relate to climate variability, but could it be used uh, as a small scale uh, sort of method to control uh, smaller loops, feedback loops, instead of using it as or at least envisioning it as a, a, a silver bullet for a large scale uh, climate uh, mitigation tactic? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so I think a couple of things worth saying here. I'm not, I'm not sure I have a great answer, but a couple of things worth saying. So one is, I mean, the kind of research that people are presently opposing is way smaller scale than what you're talking about. So like the SPICE project, I mean, they were just, they were just gonna send a couple of balloons up into the air um, and spray some of this stuff just to, just to, just to make some measurements uh, and see you know, um, how exactly, like what, 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 would a, what would a good nozzle look like? How, would, you know, how, do you, how do you spray this stuff such that it you know, creates the right chemical reactions that you're hoping to have? So, I mean, nobody, nobody's talking at this point about, um, you know, actually trying to figure out what happens at a planetary scale. Um, uh, as far as like internal variability, right? I mean, the worry is, the worry is that, um, so look, there's a, there's a couple of ways of thinking about how SRM would work. I think often people think about it, it's like, oh, this thing we'll do, we'll just kind of, We'll just set up a system and we'll spray it up there and then we'll get the effect that we want and we'll go home. Um, and then there's another sort of way of thinking about it where it's really much more of a, uh, of a, of a control theory problem, right? Where um, this is the way one, one researcher sort of explains to me. It's like, you know, you check into a hotel and you don't know how, you, you don't really know how the shower works uh, and you're trying to figure out how to make it be the temperature you like. You, you don't, you don't study, endlessly study the system and try to predict that. You stick your hand in and you, you kind of adjust it back and forth until uh, you get the right temperature you want. And, and I said, oh yeah, that's great. But you know, sometimes like these showers and hotel rooms, they take so long to respond to uh, you know, your movement of the handle that it's like almost impossible to do that. You, know, you think you find the temperature, you get in it and then five minutes later, you're getting scalded because there's a five minute delay on that. And I think, unfortunately, that's kind of how the climate system is, you know, uh, it responds slowly. Uh, it's full of, it's also, it's like, a, it's like a shower that's kind of all the time, you know, fluctuating in temperature, partly for El Nino reasons that we can predict, but then also for other reasons that we can't predict. So, um, so, so, so I think, Two, two kind of, maybe sort of two answers to you there. One, we're nowhere near discussing that level of intervention as by way of test. We're talking about much, people are objecting to much, 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 much more minor uh, kinds of uh, tests. And then the second is um, internal variability is super complicated in the climate. You know, it's, I think it's gonna be one of the, one of the most difficult things about any, any solar radiation management scheme is gonna be, um, getting, you know, like, again, in that hotel analogy, right, figuring out, like, did the water just get hotter because I turned the handle a little bit to the left, or is it just wildly fluctuating on me, right? Um, and just to think about how hard it would be to, 
to, to find the right handle setting on your shower in a hotel you weren't used to if that temperature is kind of fluctuating on you all the time. I think it's one of, it's, it's one of the things that makes the, the whole idea um, less plausible than, than it might otherwise be. I don't know if that really got your question, but that's about all I had to say about it. So. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Parjanya. Uh, Prakash Dhanabal, are you here? I, okay. Yes, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, one second. Okay. Uh, all right. The, my, my concerns are actually kind of methodological. Uh, conventionally, we usually regard the outcomes of research uh, in terms of application, but it seems in, this, uh, in your paper, uh, we get the impression that it's not just about application, but uh, there may be something more happening here. Maybe we could use the term implications of the research. The, the, the concern is that uh, it seems as though the results or outcomes or the evidence is actually no longer value neutral. You know, so it doesn't automatically uh, get applied. So I was just wondering whether this is some, your paper is a call for a newer method of justification. You know, something that uh, moves, if, I, if I'm permitted to use the Kantian distinction from quid facti to quid juris, you know, from what is the fact to what is right. So this, this kind of... Yeah, yeah. So, so I think what, so, so I think in general, you've hit on, um, you've hit on something that, that, that I find to be uh, a general, sort of general theme in philosophy of science that I find particularly interesting, right? So, so you're absolutely right. Normally, no, the sort of standard thing is like, you know, should we, should we have done research into the atomic bomb? Because if you do it, then you get atomic bombs and atomic bombs are probably mostly bad and right. Um, uh, but there's no, there's, it, it, there's no kind of, um, there's, there's no actual dovetailing there of, of ethical and epistemological questions, right? The, the, in that, in that, in that standard argument, it's, you, you know, you're just assuming that people will, people will find that, you know, they'll either find the truth or they won't about what works for making an atomic bomb. And then the question is, do we want to know those truths or not? Right. Uh, and some people might say, you don't want, those are truths you don't want to know. Um, and yeah, no, I think what, what I like about, what I like about this topic is that it's not, it's not, you know, I'm not an ethicist. Uh, I, I, I got interested in climate science. Climate science has obvious ethical implications, but where my sort of intellectual juices get flowing is when those then sort of bounce back on each other and the ethical and epistemological issues get sort of interestingly intertwined in a way they are here. So it's not just a, here, it's not just a question of, are these truths we don't want to know? Uh, it's a question of like, is, uh, is the nature of the research here such that there's going to be such a complicated interplay between what we want to believe, what we think we ought to do, um, and how the evidence is going to get evaluated. Uh, so that's why, you know, that's why this is a talk that fits the, uh, fits the theme of this, of this series, right? This, I think, is not just a talk about ethics. This is a talk about evidence. Uh, at least I, I hope it is. Does, does that kind of get? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, so, so thanks for that question. That's, uh, I think that's, to me, that's what makes this stuff super interesting. Okay, okay thanks a lot. Um, Don, uh, go ahead with your question. Hi, uh, thanks, Eric, for that wonderful talk. Um, so one of the uh, features of SRM and climate change research in general is that it sort of has this feature of being a very long-term project. It's a risky long-term project. <clears throat> and of course, um, where we have to come up with actions without being very certain. And uh, so, I mean, I, I'll tell you the context in which I'm asking this question. Um, I was... I mean, I, I'm a bit familiar with Lara Buchak's work on risk and climate science. And uh, one of the things which uh, she employs uh, when it comes to such projects, long-term risky projects, is to um, advocate for a faith-based approach. But uh, the difference here is, of course, unlike that approach, we don't have a high degree of probability in the hypothesis. So, so it's not easy for us to take that faith but one um, similarity that I see and which I did not notice in your talk was um, 
in SRM research, um, would we, uh, I mean, you, you, you didn't seem to touch upon the, the, the issue of wavering evidence. Um, because one of the aspects which Buchak talks about is, look, once we take a faith-based approach, um, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be uh, epistemically good way to, uh, uh, you know, proceed with our projects, given the wavering nature of it. Some, of course, there are different aspects of it, but uh, so in, in our case, when it comes to SRF research with wavering, I mean, is there a possible, first of all, is there a possibility of this wavering evidence such that it can um, uh, bear on anything that you say? And secondly, uh, if, if that is a possibility, then how is it that you might want to uh, proceed with such wavering? So I, you broke up maybe a couple of crucial moments there for me. What so you were saying, wavering? There's weight. There's a problem of wavering evidence. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, it could I, be either I, positive or negative. So uh, sometimes uh, experiments can prove that okay, maybe uh, SRM research or in any of the different specific experiments I'm talking about can give positive evidence, which can affect public perception in whatever way, reported in whatever way. Uh, but sometimes it might go in the other direction as well. So that is what I mean by wavering it. Yeah. Okay. Good. And so then, and so then, what's what? What am I? What am I supposed to worry? What's supposed to be the worry exactly? That. So, uh, if you have wavering evidence, um, mm. is it that um, uh, uh, your arguments will benefit, or is it that um, something else needs to be done? I see. Um, I mean, I expect I expect there would be wavering evidence. Um, uh, I suppose. One one would one would hope that um, I mean one I mean one one I, okay so one would hope right that in so far as the evidence was wavering nobody would nobody would go ahead with this um, I suppose maybe the worry would be uh, if it if it, if, it, if if the if our credences in, in this are, are fluctuating too much they might swing too too high for a moment and we might then commit ourselves to the technology uh, when the evidence was not yet supporting a kind of resilient credence or something like that. Um, I mean, there, so there are people who worry, who worry about what they call lock-in with this kind of stuff, that like, if we invest too much into the research, I mean, people think this happened maybe with the atomic bomb, I'm not entirely convinced of that. But once you, once you, once you invest too much into researching a technology, it becomes inevitable that you'll that you'll use it. Um, I mean, I think there's lots of counterexamples to that of technologies that we've invested a fair amount of, lots of drugs uh, we've we've investigated, and uh, um, uh, you know, I mean, so some people worry. Some people are worried about, for example, this Oxford coronavirus uh, vaccine. They're worried about the fact that we've already um, started manufacturing it in advance of. Uh, in advance of um, of having completed the trials, uh, I guess I probably share that worry. But that's a but that's a worry about about manufacturing, not about research. Um, yeah. So I mean, I mean, this is obviously this. I, I I mean, I certainly share your view that this is a this is likely to be uh, a context in which the evidence is not terribly decisive and in which we're going to remain under a fair amount of uncertainty. Um, I guess I feel like that's a that's a that's just a reason to, to get the best evidence that we can get. Uh, I'm not. Is it? Am I missing something? Am I missing? Am I missing something about why you think that that might push in the other direction? Or uh, uh, one th one thing I could think of is um, see the moral hazard argument. Um, um... I mean, I couldn't quite place it properly because at one point in your paper you say that um, you know, some of these environmental groups oppose it for intrinsic reasons. They are intrinsically dangerous. Right. But your overall overall strategy seems to be consequentialist to say that look, uh, we go ahead with uh, research, uh, research norms, and that should give us the kind of um, um, utility calculations which would um, persuade. Um, research in SRM. Um, so when it comes to those intrinsic dangers, um, would you would such uh, approaches have um, an advantage or disadvantage? I don't. Know. Yeah, I mean, I think that just I, I think this is what I was sort of getting at when I said a lot of this just depends on your 
degree of climate pessimism or optimism. I think if you're sufficiently if you're sufficiently optimistic about uh, you know mitigation uh, being successful, those considerations become more powerful than if, like me, you're not quite that optimistic. Um, I think you know. I also I also I guess I also think that there's 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 something, and this is this. I think this is more in the paper than in the talk. I definitely think there's a there's a kind of um, there's a there's a kind of strand of uh, at least in the United States, uh, but probably more widespread than that. There's a kind of strand of thinking which says you know techno fixes are always bad. Um, there's a kind of you know some people have just a kind of deep fundamental aversion to uh, to techno fixes, which is a kind of you know uh, usually pejorative expression. Uh, techno fixes of harms that humans are, are causing in the environment that you should just always, 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 uh, you know, get to the root cause of the harm and not try to somehow fix it. Um, and I guess I, you know, I don't, I don't have quite as strong of a, you know, commitment to that kind of way of thinking as other people do. Um, I think if, if we can have, if we can have, if we can fix problems, I don't, I don't have a sort of, metaphysical opposition to that strategy or whatever. Yeah, all right, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Don. Uh, Dashi, uh, go ahead. You're, kind of, you're muted, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, yeah, uh, Eric, uh, uh, thank you very much. Very good paper. Uh, you and I share something you probably don't know about. We got PhD from the same university in different departments. Uh, okay. Or maybe, maybe Noretta is the only one still there from my time. <laughs> Noretta, I saw Noretta not that long ago. Uh, anyway, so maybe oh. five or six years ago. Yeah. yeah. And then I apologize for not reading your paper. I'm always pushing everybody to read the paper and come. So I have a very general question, maybe a little off track, but I didn't see any other. Oh, some hands are there now. So, so I, I, I'll speed it up. Okay. So. Uh, this is, I, I got like some people are making a sort of a categorical argument almost a priori that any geoengineering, uh, you know, uh, should not be done. So I don't know how serious that is, but I have a real problem, some problem with that from just point of view of what kind of reasoning is going on because you mentioned uh, climate repair. So if you're doing research on uh, climate repair, I, let me just give the analogy first. So Neil Armstrong, you know, they went to the moon and accidentally he left, uh, you know, some radioactive stuff there, okay? And, and he comes back and now, you know, there were people against going, you know, you're, you're going to the moon, you're in, yeah, there's religious people, all kinds of people saying we shouldn't be interfering. And now, now if you, you send a mission back, you can bring that radioactive uh, thing back. I don't see how anybody could say that that was not correct. Okay. So, so, so when you think climate repair, if, if the, if the climate repair is for the damage caused by humans, right. Uh, uh, caused by nuclear waste, all kinds of things, you know, and if we can, uh, then if the, if the, if the research on climate repair is to repair that, so how are we interfering with climate change in that case? This is my question. Well, I mean, I guess what I'll play devil's advocate for a sec, right? I guess what these people would say is that's just a propaganda term. You're not actually repairing it. You're not going to moon, you're not going to the moon to get the radioactive material. You're you're sending some some more radioactive material to the moon and hoping that it'll cancel out the other radioactive material or something like that, right? Um, but but so but, but having said that, I, I I tend to be somewhat impatient with people who think that there's a kind of obvious a priori answer to this, that somehow like, so I mean, it's just, yeah. So I think, like I said before, I think that there's some people who just are intrinsically opposed to techno fixes. They think, you know, they, use, they have that expression. It's a pejorative term to them. They think it's always bad. I don't share that. I, I'm a little impatient with that. I'm even more impatient with, I think some people who sometimes detect, think that, um, the real problem with, with the real problem with, with, uh, with something like a geoengineering strategy is it, it will, it will, it will give humans like 
a sense of hubris that they can that they can that they will, will, will learn a lesson you know from and they, it's like they almost want they almost they almost want uh, the damage you, you know they almost want a catastrophe so that humans will learn a lesson about you know the bad things that we did in the last century or something like that. I mean nobody of course nobody comes right out and says that but you sometimes detect that I'm, I'm, I'm basically I, I'm basically impatient with with people who don't want to just kind of uh, really weigh the you know weigh the evidence carefully and 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 not just be kind of dogmatically uh, opposed. Uh, so I, I I think I think we it sounds like we more or less agree on that. But but I do think I do think people a lot of people would say yeah that word climate repair that's propaganda it's not really repair uh, it's canceling out and canceling out is not the same thing. It's, it's not going to really be canceling out, so it's not really the same thing at all as repair. Okay, uh, thanks, Dashi. Uh, Jyoti, go ahead. Hello. Uh, my question is regarding Good's theorem. So, where Kitcher worries that the decision making activity may not go well with respect to new evidence as one thinks it should. Uh, especially when we talk about how a society with deeply ingrained forms of sexism and racism responds to a new scientific evidence. So looking at this process of, uh, of, uh, of absence of reflection condition and at this contingent sociological facts from the point of a value system, isn't it fair to say that this is a failure of non-epistemic values like equality and reliability in scientific practices, uh, specifically in a group context. Yeah, that seems that seems that seems right. Um, uh, so I, uh, I, I guess I'm not exactly. Your question was: Is is this a failure of non-epistemic values? Yes. Um, I mean, look, I think this is a uh, this is a sort of underappreciated fact uh, about. The world and life and science and how it goes um, that people have values and it affects how they appraise hypotheses and this is sort of an un un unavoidable this is an unavoidable fact about um, about scientific inference it's, it's very difficult to do I mean scientific scientific inference is hard uh, it's as Hempel put it always inductively risky uh, you always you are always deciding what to believe on the basis of incomplete evidence, at least in interesting questions. And when you decide what to believe in on the basis of incomplete evidence, it's very hard to keep your values from affecting how you uh, decide how strong the evidence is. Um, uh, is that a failure? I mean, it's a failure relative to some ideal that we might have hoped for, but it's, I think, just the way the world turns out to be. Uh, was, there, was there something else you were was there, something, was there something else you were asking that? Yeah. No, no. Uh, this was this was it. Okay. Because uh, since uh, it has like uh, these, uh, it has been talked about sexism and racism. So I was wondering that uh, these are related to non-epistemic values. So this is also a failure of such kind of values. But uh, I understand that this is how. Yeah. Yeah. So so look, I I agree with I, I basically agree with Kitcher that um, I agree with Kitcher that. Uh, that this is a this is a this creates a matrix in which it then becomes possible to to oppose certain kinds of research on 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 the sorts of grounds that he does. Uh, I just my project here in a way was to say, well, does this does this argument work in the in the SRM case? Um, and I sort of thought, well, not really. I don't think it does. But yeah, I think it it might very well work in the in the in the case that he's envisioning because because it, because I think he's right. Um, and you know, and, and, and the, the literature that he's that he's appealing to here is right that um, it's naive to just think, oh, well, we'll just collect the evidence, and then if it shows, you know, what's the harm in collecting evidence? It'll just show whatever it shows. Um, no, I think that's I think that's wrong. There are always going to be evidence doesn't show things in in, in a value neutral way. So yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jyoti. Deepak, uh, you have a question. Go ahead. Uh, uh, hi, for a, this is a lovely talk actually, and I work in the, uh, I research in the field of oil and gas industry. Uh, 
so I had this question that isn't the pursuit of research uh, also about what works and not what doesn't work. So the scale becomes very important. If some research is carried out at a pilot scale, you know it's a system and various technologies are being tried out. So you have the carbon capture, uh, then you have this uh, radiation one. So if there is a government liability that is put on, if something goes wrong and there is public oversight, I think that system, I kind of agree that that would be a much better system where uh, there is a public oversight and there is a government liability if anything goes wrong and the scale is important at what scale that research is going on and different technologies, how much funding is going on into different technologies. So I mean, uh, until there is public oversight, I think uh, it's just kind of, uh, I mean, I, I can buy that argument. Yeah. So I think part of the problem here is that part of the problem here is that um, uh, what people's real oppositions are, and then what what you know what what arguments they make that they think might be effective aren't the same, right? So I think people who people who oppose this research they oppose it for the reasons that I said, right? They think it they think it causes moral hazard. They think they think that it. Um, they think that it might create lock-in. They think that it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, right when 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 the rubber meets the road, they want to say they want like the spice project. They wanted to they wanted to block it on the grounds that it violated the the convention on biodiversity. And so then they have to say that oh this you know this actual experiment. They, 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 you, you can't oppose something. Uh, as violating the Convention on Biological Diversity by saying it causes moral hazard. You have to say, oh, this actual, this actual physical experiment might, might harm biodiversity. I, 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 don't, I don't think people probably really think these small scale experiments are gonna do that. Uh, they're, I think their they're real, they're real motivations are not you know, regarding the dangers of the actual experiment. They're, they're concerned about the dangers of having a research project at all. But then of course they try to, you know, I mean, which makes sense. I mean, if I, if, I agree, if I agreed with opposing the research, I wouldn't be necessarily opposed to using that strategy. Um, but yeah, so I don't, I, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not so much, I, I don't think anybody really thinks that these very small scale experiments are sort of intrinsically dangerous. Uh, they're, they're, they think that the, the, re the global research project of which they are a part uh, are dangerous for not direct physical reasons. Okay, uh, thanks Deepak. Um, so since there don't seem to be any hands at the moment, oh, Tashi is there, but I'll come to you in a second, Tashi. Um, I just wanted to kind of follow up a little bit on the question I had asked previously. Um, so maybe I, I don't think I conveyed exactly the concern I was talking about, I may, but maybe your answer will be the same. But I think the concern is slightly different um, so what I was, I think, suggesting is that there, there is signaling value associated with sort of declaring a moratorium or a ban or a prevention of funding in certain research, right? That, and that's the value of that. So, so that this is maybe not direct cost of learning, but the cost of learning is a kind of opportunity cost of not having that signaling value in some sense. So mm -hmm. one might imagine that, say, you had some funding agency uh, that declared that it's not going to fund any research on uh, racial differences in IQ or something like this, right? Um, and the reasons for that might have very little to do with, the, with any assumption about the consequences of that research, uh, any assumptions about the prior probability of that hypothesis being true. It might simply have to do with the fact that given the nature of the organization, they need to send a signal of kind of respect for whatever body they represent. And, and, and the, the, the declaring that moratorium on funding is a means of sending that signal, right? Um, and so um, what I'm suggesting is that this is another kind of, so I mean, obviously there's different ways in which you can think about resisting this kind of research, but there might be certain ways of doing that, which might be legitimate based on this kind of signaling concern, that in a world where people often don't react in, I guess, the optimally rational way to decisions made, especially by politically significant bodies, it might make sense for politically significant bodies to say, you know, we don't support any research on this. Uh, we support 
kind of the, the more consensual mechanisms that already exist with the um, uh, UNFCCC or whatever, right? Okay, so, 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 so let me, yeah, so let me, let me see if I exactly, so I, I completely get your point in the, in the, in the Kitcher case. It goes something like this, right? Um, if I'm a funding agency uh, uh, and I believe in um, sort of, you know, fundamental respect of all humans, uh, I might think that um, there's a positive value in just saying, no, I'm not funding this garbage. Uh, the, the very idea of this kind of crap is so fundamentally at odds with respect, you know, equal respect for all human beings that I'm not going to miss an opportunity to put my foot down and say, we don't truck in this. Um, uh, and then I, I take it, you're, you're, I thought you're, so what, what's the, you know, the, 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 I thought you were suggesting that the, um, the comparable thing here is, right, the, the analogous thing to fundamental equal respect of all human beings was respect for international governance and respect for... Right, uh, so I, I, I guess... So I, so I, so I guess, I, so I, I, guess I don't quite... I guess what I was trying to say in my first answer, and which I'm still maybe trying to say now, is I don't, I don't quite get how that... I don't quite get how um, how the connection is as obvious in this case as it is in the race and gender. Well, I don't think it's at all as obvious. I think it's much less or how, obvious. Or, yeah, or how, or how it goes. So in other words, it's not clear to me why, uh, it's not clear to me why I should think that, um, so it's, it's pretty obvious to me that, uh, you know, declaring we don't truck in this, you know, racist garbage uh, research um, sends a kind of signal that uh, we have respect, you know, we, we, we uphold the value of, of, of all human beings should be treated with respect. Uh, I don't, I guess I don't quite see how it goes in this case. I mean, look, so, so I think maybe, maybe, so the, 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 the situation of Sarah scenario you described in your previous response to me, which was yeah. one where, where, you know, we could do this in a kind of cooperative manner, potentially right. we could. Right. Um, I, so, I mean, I take that to be, a response that I mean, in in a kind of ideal epistemic sense, makes sense. But when you're talking about a political context, it would be the analog of, say, a funding agency in the case of the racist thing, saying that no, we fund these things, but our commitment is that this research is basically meant to promote equality. It'll never be used uh, in a way that will harm any person. But I mean, yeah, I guess, that's not okay, the way it's going but, to be but, taken, right? But, that's not yeah, the way it's going to be I mean, taken by yeah, people. Good. Good, good, good. But I mean, I, I guess I, I mean, I guess if, if someone said that to me, what? How is this? You know, and I take it this is Kitcher's point. How is this going to be? Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Um, what kind of fantasy world do you live in where you think that you know this that 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 this um, that this does anything other than 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 diminish our, you know, our fundamental respect for human beings. Uh, whereas I just, I don't see why I should think it's a, I don't see why I should think it's like a fantasy to think that we could have internationally governed geo Isn't the point of projects. signaling not what makes sense, but what people would actually take the signal to be? And I think the problem is that the, the, what people would take the signal to be would be an indication of, yeah, of disrespect for a kind of yeah. more international yeah. consensus. Yeah, maybe. I don't, May, that's a, that's a, um, that seems to me a very plausible claim in the, in the race case, okay. race and gender case, um, and I'm not terribly, I don't know. I mean, it's an empirical question. Um, yeah, look, I mean, it, it certainly seems, so it certainly seems to me that some people have this reaction, right? Some people think, uh, some people seem to seem to have the reaction that um, since since such a system would obviously have winners and losers, it could never be internationally cooperative. And so the very idea of looking into it signals a disregard for um, signals a disregard for kind of international cooperation. Um, so there's a, then there's 
complicated question of like, should they believe that? Or does it not matter if they should believe that as long as they do believe it? But then I need to know how many people believe that. And uh, I, don't, I don't, yeah, I mean, okay. So I, I think I see your point a little bit better now. Um, okay. Right, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's worth, it's it's worth thinking about. I don't really know what more to say. Yeah, I agree. It's not at all clear that, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. Prakash Thanabal has a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm again uh, probably, uh, you know, extending my uh, previous question, but uh, I, I really was wondering whether, you know, I'm actually curious whether this uh, the kind of problematics that you've uh, raised in your paper is peculiar to uh, global uh, warming or climate change. What I have in mind is uh, that, uh, is there some assumption that, you know, that global uh, problems uh, require global uh, solutions? Now, uh, and so I'm, I'm kind of trying to see if uh, this, this kind of problem uh, would, would apply to other fields. You know, for example, right now when the pandemic is going on, we have uh, uh, similar concerns with the, with the vaccine trials. So I'm really thinking if, if there is some issue about the match of the tools to the domain. So, so in, in this sense, like uh, you are uh, actually looking in terms of the failure of local or small scale uh, solutions and uh, so you automatically you need to presuppose some kind of a cosmopolitan ethics so that uh, even before uh, we consider what the solution should be. Uh, so the vaccine trials is not entirely obvious to me why it would fit the kind of thinking I'm doing here. But I think one case that definitely does fit the kind of thinking here, um, because I was, you know, uh, until the pandemic hit in March, I was visiting the, the um, uh, Institute for Practical Ethics at, at uh, UCSD, which is um, mostly funded by the uh, Indian car company, Tata. And uh, it's funded by them because one of the things they work on is this mosquito stuff, uh, you know, gene drive, um, uh, gene drive efforts to eradicate the kinds of mosquitoes that transmit malaria. Um, and that has, I think, very, very, very similar kinds of uh, uh, considerations. It, it, it gets opposition on the same grounds. Uh, it's supported by people on the same sorts of grounds. Um, could you say a little bit maybe about why, what you think is what you think is going on with the with the vaccine trials? That, yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, but my real concern is whether you need to be looking at alternative paradigms of research. Basically, what what I what what I was I was only giving that as an analogy, broad analogy. Mm -hmm. But uh, because you're dealing with, in climate change, you're dealing with a global, uh, uh, a global issue. So uh, but speaking in terms of reliability and uh, uh, validity may not be sufficient. And so I'm, I'm thinking if, uh, you know, even the, the paradigm, of, paradigm of scientific research needs to look at uh, uh, alternatives such as systems-based uh, research or dynamics and then uh, mm -hmm. communities of practice approaches. Would that in any way solve the issues that you brought up in this case? And then the issue that uh, it may, like somebody else brought it up, it is a failure of uh, non-epistemic value. So uh -huh. if, if we accept that argument and then uh, maybe in these, uh, uh, in this kind of situations, we, we kind of uh, have some constraints that there must be some kind of a cosmopolitan uh, uh, kind of uh, an ethic that uh, needs to uh, uh, be presupposed before we even uh, look at technical issues, which, yeah. is not, which is not the way we usually think in terms of uh, other uh, other right. fees. I mean, so no, I think so. So, so I think they're probably you know they're probably we're probably going to face more and more research questions like this that that tap into um, cosmopolitan, international, acquire international governance, etc. Where different different agents around the globe are going to have different interests. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm gen I guess I'm generally persuaded that um, these things best work in parallel. I don't think, um, I don't think, I, I think it's hard to just kind of um, sit down at the table internationally and, and, and decide a, a priori in advance what, what's best for the planet. I think uh, this is most likely to go best if that if this happens in tandem. If we if we develop an international body of scientists who 
uh, who have a, a, a who, who who develop some trust uh, from the global from from the global populace, um, and you can then help us to to I don't I just don't think you can get a good agreement of international governance in the absence of a of a body of scientists who then you can who can then say look here's what we think and here's what you know we have we have among us are representatives from the United States and India and Europe and China uh, and and this is what we've all this is what we've all agreed is true um, I just think it's you're just more likely to reach international governance in a situation like that than where you just say like hey before we even look into any of this we all need to sit down at the table and decide you know what's in the best interest of the world people aren't likely to People aren't, I mean, state agents aren't likely to, to reach agreements under ignorance like that. I just don't think they are. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dashi, go ahead. Dashi, are you there? Yeah, 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 come uh, Yeah, coming. Okay, I, I uh, Eric, I found one more similarity between us, so I can ask another question. I didn't see yeah. any hands so That is, my brother got his master's from South Florida. Ah, nice. <laughs> okay, and there's some uh, Marxist guy named Truett. I don't know if you. He, he, oh yeah, 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 yeah. He was he was my colleague. He was my colleague ages ago. I think. He, oh okay, okay, okay. He was my colleague for like two years when I first got here. Willis okay. Truett. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so I have this sort of wired uh, thing because again because I didn't read your paper. It is if I can if I'm allowed to make two illegitimate moves, I, I make a generalization from research to policy, let's say. And and I move within the political realm and I say that uh, issue of reparations. Okay, so I say that the American government owes some reparations to Native Americans, you know, for the genocide they've committed. Uh, and uh, that one reparation can be to withdraw the pipeline from Standing Rock. Okay. Now, now, now if I take the, the, the categorical argument again, it, it seems to me to be just don't interfere with the status quo. Okay. And this is the way I'm, 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 I'm it's exaggerating. So as I said, no, even if they agree, even, even if the Native Americans are agreeing with that, I, you know, I, I use this every uh, no interference, you know, leave the status quo as, as it is. So this reparation argument, just throw it out. And then we can generalize to other situations, you know, uh, reparations for slavery, for colonialism, all kinds of other things. Can so I guess it's more of a comment. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure what, yeah, yeah okay. I, I, don't, I don't have, I'm not sure I have anything terribly yeah. wise to say it back about any of that, so. They're more for fun. Yeah. All right, uh, Don has a question. Oh, sorry, Prajit has a question. I'm gonna come to Don. Yeah, Prajit, go ahead. Prajit, you're muted. Um, yeah, hi, Eric, it's a really lovely paper, but Thank I you. have like a general comment because I'm, I'm worried about something uh, which gets reflected in, uh, Point number two on slide number 39 on moral hazard. Oh, it's right here. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the first question is Does it send a signal like all is well, technology will save us, and we are free to ease restrictions on high carbon emitting industries? Uh, and <clears throat> two, or, two or three points sort of uh, I want to flag and try to get a, a comment from you. Uh, See, uh, the notion of climate change uh, is, becomes a part of the discourse only during the later part of 1990s uh, uh, and then subsequently. Uh, <clears throat> until then, the, the discourse was uh, motivated by global warming. That begins to take a backseat slowly. So here is therefore even the framing of the question is motivated by certain kinds of, uh, uh, I would say, normative worries. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, certain kinds of um, worries about if we talk about global warming, then we need to find out who are the global warmers 
and uh, start looking at who are, as, as it were culprits and so on. Whereas climate change is a lot more, uh, uh, um, you know, normatively uh, um, less um, sort of, uh, uh, um, but, and, I mean, it's, it's normatively uh, less uh, uh, um, or has uh, l less uh, uh, strength as compared to uh, global warming and <clears throat> if if that is uh, that that is true or that is plausible then the framing of the question and then subsequently looking for appropriate ways to address climate change uh, uh, takes on a different kind of uh, scientific effort and uh, so SAI or uh, SRM research is motivated by this reframing of the, uh, uh, the question as it were. Uh, and this gets connected to what uh, Priyadashi was talking about, because now you would be talking about climate repair. Uh, uh, earlier, you wouldn't be talking about climate repair, but now you would. Um, and therefore, um, if you are able to come up with certain kinds of climate repair technologies, uh, and, and, and I'm not doubting any of the worries that uh, these technologies uh, um, throw up, and as you have very uh, you know, lucidly brought it out, but then it, it brings out a normative feature that, which is the second part of your, uh, uh, of the sentence of the first signaling. We are free to ease restrictions on high carbon emitting industries. So therefore we are no more morally responsible for what we had done earlier. So uh, now the question then is that, is it the case that whenever, if, if we want to take up an SI, SAI research, SRM research or whatever, uh, uh, the values associated with reframing of the question get uh, um, involved in uh, uh, pursuing this new research or put it another way do the values associated with the earlier framing of the questions get jettisoned and therefore uh, it gives rise to a certain kinds of problem and it gets connected to what Tarun was earlier mentioning that here is a funding agency who says look I'm not going to fund anything that sort of you know talks about race and IQ and so on and so forth because for me the individuals human beings are you know in some sense primary they are the the basis of all moral concerns so I'm not going to do any kind of uh, funding of research which brings about certain kinds of uh, you know uh, divisions among human beings at large I don't know whether Tarun meant it that way but I read him or interpreted his point in this way. So uh, is there, I mean, again, this is, this is a huge question, I know, or huge worry, but I wonder whether uh, uh, um, the question about reframing uh, or the values associated with reframing the question get, you know, uh, in some way incorporated in this research, the new research that is happening. Okay, so um, maybe this isn't terribly, I, I, I didn't quite understand the claim that going from global warming to climate change was a kind of moral reframing. Um, I, I always thought of that just as more a way of changing the emphasis on what the expected harms are. So just as a way of reminding people that it's not just going to get hotter, uh, it's also going to mess up precipitation patterns and change sea level rise and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but maybe that, maybe, but maybe, maybe, maybe your point isn't really, your point is just, I take it that um, it's important to think of the sort of moral 
framing of what the problem is and that in particular, it seems like you were emphasizing that it's important to keep as part of the moral framework that, that certain agents are culpable in it. Is that, is, is the worry that somehow, that somehow, um, so, so maybe this, maybe this is, you were framing out Tarun's worry this way. So I got Tarun's worry quite, quite cogently in the, in the, in the race case, let's say, right. That by, um, by refusing to fund this, we are affirming that everybody should be treated with respect. And so maybe you're saying in this case, by refusing to fund SAI research, we're affirming that certain parties are morally culpable for having gotten us to the situation in which we're in and that you're missing an opportunity to, to affirm that. Is that, is that the idea? Well, that's, that's part of it. But I, okay. I'm also, also wondering whether uh, uh, by reframing it, we, we, we are uh, sort of uh, closing down on the values or the norms associated with asking the, with uh, the, the <coughs> effort that went in, in asking the question as, is there global warming and what caused global warming? And the research associated with uh, figuring out what caused global warming yeah. and the research associated with how to you know, uh, mitigate global warming. So, right. so this, is, this, is, this, is what, this was my way. Yeah, I mean, I take, it, I take it this is all predicated on the idea that we know what caused, what's caused and is continuing to cause global warming. Um, it's partially, I suppose the bigger, you know, the worry that people usually have is that somehow we're signaling that mitigation might be impossible. Um, and it might, it, it just, it, it might be, I don't know. So, yeah, I guess I'm, I, I, I don't quite get what, I don't quite get what is being reframed here exactly. Uh, but Anyway, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure what else to say about. Okay, um, so I think we have time for one more question. Don, Don has a question, All right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I was uh, looking at um, you know how you uh, uh, positioned your arguments, um, you know, by looking at Kitcher and commenting on Kitcher. You said, I mean, his empirical claims uh, they don't have a, an analog in. The, what you're looking for, which is And then later on, you go on to show uh, what are the kind of empirical questions which matter, which is the ungovernability and something else. I think it was about scientific possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering whether, I mean, I mean, are there any lessons in the way you approach to, um, you know, showcase the way in which you, uh, 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 present these uh, empirical promises, which is, which is to say, look, these are the ways in which you can empirically go about and do your work and use that to inform your position. Are there any uh, ways one could use this strategy in Kitcher's argument? Because you say that, well, Kitcher's argument is reasonable. You sort of seem to be persuaded by it. But if you were to be asked, well, are there any more um, ways to I mean, not attack Kitcher, but but you know, uh, critically look at Kitcher's argument by uh, opening up new avenues for um, uh, empirical investigation. Yeah, I mean, look. So there are obviously there's some empirical claims Kitcher is relying on. Kitcher is relying on the empirical claim that um, he's relying on the empirical claim that um, people are. Uh, unlikely to take evidence seriously that suggests that there are no fundamental differences, but that they are likely to take evidence seriously that there are differences. Yeah. He's relying on the empirical premise that um, people are, uh, that people are um, willing to go about their ordinary racist and sexist behaviors, even in, even while, even while 
pretending to believe or, you know, actually believing or pretending to believe or acting as if they believe that there are no um, genetic or but no bio, there is no biological uh, foundation for for different outcomes, uh, but 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 the opposite, but that the vice versa claim is is not true. So 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 he so he has these he has these these empirical he has these empirical premises for sure. Um, I just think that uh, our uh, at least you know at least among Americans. This, you know, I'll just I'll just speak about this in the American context because I don't know enough about it, it anywhere else. I think in the American context, I feel like my intuitions about about those empirical premises are more reliable than they are about the about geoengineering premises, right? So I I feel like I have a pretty good, I like picture. I feel like I have a pretty good read on what Americans think about race and gender, uh, in a way that I'm just not will I'm not as willing to to guess. Uh, I think it's it's not really a difference in what's empirical or what isn't. It's just it's just a difference in in my epistemic attitude about those empirical premises. I I feel like I have a pretty good feel for how Americans react to evidence about race and gender and what they think and how racist and sexist they are. And uh, I just I just I just don't have as good of a feel for for example like what do people think about what do people think about you know how important mitigation is if they find out that that um, we're investigating solar radiation management. I, it's just most, my guess is, my guess is that, my guess is that the overwhelming majority, for example, my guess is that the overwhelming majority of Americans are familiar with some research into uh, whether, um, you know, men are smarter than women or whatever. But most Americans have heard of that idea and have heard of I've read, you know, have, have seen something on TV about that, but that most of them have never heard of solar radiation management. So it's just, it's, it's not that one has empirical premises and the other doesn't, it's that one, it's that both have similar empirical premises, but one I'm, I'm, I'm more willing to make, to place my bets on what, what the truths are. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. So uh, we're at the end of our time. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Eric, for yeah, thank you a lovely for talk me. and a great uh, discussion, very productive discussion, I think. Um, yeah, and thanks a lot for being here, uh, I think, fairly early in the morning, your time. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, uh, I guess that is the end of today's session. Um, we'll be meeting again next week. Um, for those of you who are still around, we, uh, the time next week will unfortunately be slightly later than usual, but uh, I'll send an email about that. Uh, our guest next week is Professor James Woodward. I hope to see all of you there uh, next week as well. And uh, all right. Thanks, all right. everyone. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Good luck with the rest of the series. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah.